Hello. This video is derived from a hands-on wet lab and seminar that was hosted by Cornell University and the University of Maine for goat breeders who wanted to learn more about using artificial insemination in their herds. Uh, we try to incorporate uh, videos, uh, PowerPoint presentations, and, and pictures to give you an idea of the flavor of the lab and, and give uh, some of the information that the participants learned over two days uh, during this, this workshop in Canton, New York. My name is Jim Weber. I'm a faculty member and a veterinarian at the University of Maine. I'm in the School of Food and Agriculture. I too teach and do research in animal and veterinary sciences. Uh, my contact, if you want to get a hold of me, is jaweber at maine.edu. Uh, this part of the seminar series is going to talk a little bit about female reproductive anatomy in the doe uh, to get you an idea of what, uh, when you do artificial insemination, you have to have a picture in your mind of of the place you need to put the frozen thawed semen. And so you have to actually be able to um, visualize and then pass a pipette into the cervix of the doe. And to know that you have to know a little bit about uh, female reproductive anatomy. I'm also gonna talk a little bit about handling of semen. Uh, this, in this case, we're talking about frozen semen that perhaps you've bought from um, you know, someone who freezes buck semen uh, professionally. Uh, for example, there's a number of companies out there that, that freeze semen for dairy goat breeders. So we'll talk a little bit about all the different parts of that. Um, let me go back. So this is a really nice diagram from a book called Pathways to Pregnancy and Par Parturition by um, Dr. Phil Sanger. And it's a very good resource, actually, if you're interested in learning more about the anatomy and also the hormones that are involved in, in reproduction and in ruminants, uh, this book is great. Uh, I use it in a college level class uh, for senior animal science students. Um, and Dr. Sanger has done a marvelous job of, of actually putting all this together, very visual. So um, if you want to delve into this more, I, I recommend the book. Um, so if we look at these pictures, we've, and this is actually a, a diagram of a cow's reproductive tract, but, but really most of the parts look almost exactly the same except smaller. So here we're looking at the, the cow from the side, and here we're looking at the cow from on top. And you can see back here, this is actually the reproductive tract. Um, we start with the vagina, the cervix, the uterine horns, and you notice they make a big loop here. And then we end up with the ovaries up on the top. Above the reproductive tract is the rectum, and the tail goes above that. Looking at it from the top, we see the same structures in the same area within the, uh, the ruminant. Uh, and you can see, again, the, the part that I want you to concentrate on is the cervix is in you know, a short distance uh, down the vagina, and then that leads into both uterine horns. And, and what we're trying to do basically is to deposit semen somewhere within this cervix, um, partway through the cervix ideally, um, maybe even all the way through the cervix into the, the beginning of the uterus. And then this, this, the sperm cell that are in the, that semen, the sperm cells are gonna swim up the uterine horns until they reach the oviduct, where the, the egg will meet them and fertilization will occur. So again, looking at these a little bit more close up, again, we can see the different structures. Um, and again, very important when we artificially inseminate a dough, uh, the reference point is we're gonna put a, a clear plastic speculum into the vagina. And then we are gonna be able to see what's called the external ostium or opening of the cervix sort of right in the middle of that um, speculum. It's a little round tube. It looks like glass, but it's made of plastic in most cases. And there'll be an opening there, very, very small opening that you need to pass an insemination pipette into. So again, same thing. Um, again, we, we don't really worry too much about what's passed here, but, but again, you need to know kind of why you're doing this. This is a picture again from Dr. Sanger's uh, textbook showing 
the and what in this case what they did is they they took a ewe to slaughter and this is again very similar to what we would see in a doe um, and what we're looking at is they've cut this ewe basically in half from front to back you can see here's the the wool you can see in the skin and this would be the inner layer of the abdominal wall okay that you can see here this is actually the peritoneal lining and up higher would be the backbone up near the top uh, so what we see here basically is you've got the rectum is, is up in this area going out towards the anal sphincter. Um, and right below that, we have, again, the vagina. The cervix in this animal would be somewhere around this point here. And then we're looking at the uterine horns. And again, most of the, the vagina and the cervix are sitting on top of what's called the inside of the the pelvis. Okay, so the pelvis is, pelvic girdle is in around here. And then the uterus sort of drops down into the abdominal um, cavity. And as, you know, if we're successful and we create a pregnancy, uh, this uterus gets bigger and bigger and starts filling in a large amount of space in here. And that's where our, our kids come from. On the left and the right side are the ovaries. Um, this shows the oviduct. It looks sort of like a little worm right there. I don't know if you guys can see that. Um, and this oval structure here in, in a sheep, it's probably about the size of a large raisin, um, is the ovary. Uh, we're seeing right here is a follicle on that ovary. Um, this ovary has several small little blisters, small follicles, and it has a structure called a corpus luteum, which is a solid progesterone producing um, gland. That, that's produced during the uh, estrus cycle of the, the dough. So gives you a little bit of an idea of kind of what we're looking at in the live animal. This is an excised reproductive tract from a goat. Uh, again, looking at it kind of from a different direction. The cervix on this animal is basically reaches from about here to here. And then the uterus starts, and you can see it's a little bit of a darker, these are softer tissues. Uh, the cervix is sort of cartilaginous. And you can see the uterine horns. There's the oviduct, a really good view of the oviduct on this animal. And that widens and covers the right ovary in this case. And then we've got the, the left um, ovary and, and oviduct right here. So again, when we're looking at this animal um, in terms of trying to inseminate it, we would be looking in at the cervical ostium, which would be right down in here. This shows an open view of a small ruminant reproductive tract. So what was done here is, again, the reproductive tract was, was laid down. It was cut open at the top and, and folded out so we could see the inside. And again, um, this is the skin, uh, what's called the vestibule. Um, cranial vagina, and then we see the cervix. And, and this is a really important photograph because the opening of the cervix pretty much does this. Okay, if we put a pipette through here to get it from this point to this point, we don't go straight. We actually, there's a bunch of very small little projections within this cervix that cause any pipette we have to deviate. And we actually have to go through all the way here. And, and this is very difficult to actually pass a rigid pipette, um, you know, using a speculum in a live animal through the cervix without doing any damage. So in most cases, what we try to do is get into the cervical opening and get through, and these are called cervical rings, each of these little projections. Um, and there might be five of them in a, in a typical cervix, four or five. We're trying to get through at least a couple of cervical rings so that we've got a centimeter or two of our pipette in the cervix and the semen would be deposited in this area somewhere. That would be optimum. And then what would happen is the sperm cells would swim out and would populate the uterus and then start working their way up. This is a, um, another orientation of that black and white photo I showed you two slides back. And again, showing you the cervix itself. So the vagina has sort of been folded back here um, off to the sides. Uh, normally it would be sort of coming in this way 
towards you, but you can see the, the vaginal walls are fairly smooth. And then once we end up getting into the cervix, it projects out. It, there's a bunch of little papillae that come in like this. And if we look, there's an opening right in there. And then we call that the cervical ostium. So this is what you would see when you were actually using a lighted speculum and you've got a goat in a, in a stand so it's, it's not able to move very much and you're trying to pass a pipette into that animal's cervix. This actually is a picture that was taken in a live goat uh, during artificial insemination um, wet lab. Um, in New York a few years back. And you can see that same cervix looks very similar to the other image. Um, and you can see, it's, it's difficult to see, but right about there, there's, there's actually an opening to that cervix, a little dimple that kind of dimples in. Cervix is projecting out towards us. The walls of the vagina come in this way. The, the shiny thing here is actually the, the uh, speculum. It's, it's again, it's a clear plastic speculum that goes around in a big circle like that. And it's actually gonna be sticking out the back end of the dough a, a little bit. So you're looking in through the end of this speculum and this is actually a light source that fits along the side of the speculum and shines light right at the point where we want it to be like a flashlight. So we get a good illumination of this area. There's other, uh, vaginal speculums we use that are there you can buy commercially that the light is actually incorporated into the wall of these um, clear lucite speculums and it just when you turn it on it just makes the whole speculum glow bright and those work very well also but you need a good light source uh, for those of you uh, like me who um, our eyes have stopped adjusting in terms of you know fine focus close up and we need to use uh, bifocals and things like that. Sometimes it's difficult to, to actually be able to visualize the cervix. I find the younger people uh, are better at it uh, than I am, for example, because of that. And I've got special glasses I use for that. So you may need some reading glasses because the distance you're looking at is about that far probably that, that you're gonna need to focus at. Um, so anyway, that kind of gives you an idea of, of um, the anatomy uh, we'll talk about the hormones we use to actually control the estrous cycle in those reproductive organs so that they're producing the hormones that are going to bring those, those into estrus at the right time. So the next thing I want to talk about is the lab, okay? And in this case, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about processing semen. Let's say you've got a, a buck and you want to collect semen from him, what you need to do that. But this also applies to a certain extent for semen that you buy, because one thing as a veterinarian that I do is if I get frozen semen from an outside source, uh, the first time I thaw that semen and, and put some into the dough, it's about a half cc straw or quarter cc straw, depending on, on what we have. So we have about a quarter of a mil. Um, I take a very small drop of that semen before, and you know the rest goes into the dough, but I take a very small bit of it and I go and I look and, and see whether or not that semen has good motility and has actually been packaged at the concentration that uh, the label says it was, that the supplier tells me that there's, you know, 50 million live sperm cells in that straw, for example. So this picture up on the left is actually from a sheep artificial insemination station in Iceland. Um, it's actually just north of Reykjavik, Iceland. And uh, these folks have 20, 25 of the best Icelandic rams, Icelandic breed rams in the world. And they're actually in, in a barn that's over here on the left. And this dark area, there's like a little window that opens up into a ram collection area. So the rams are brought into this room and they're brought up behind a, a U and estrus. And then they're collected with what's called an artificial vagina. And the semen ends up in a very small little graduated cylinder at, at the end of the, what we call the AV, the artificial vagina. And it's passed through this window to this fella. He's, a, he's a, actually an equine veterinarian in Selfoss, Iceland. <laughs> and what he does 
is he goes in and, and tests every sample as it comes in before it gets packaged into straws. But he's doing very much the same things that you would do to make sure that you're putting vi viable frozen semen into your, into your doughs. So over here on the left side, uh, you can't see it very well, but there's a temperature controlled water bath and that's got a rack in it. So as soon as the sample comes out of the, the collection room, it goes into um, basically a, a container that's in water at just below body temperature. Uh, he also has a, a good microscope where he can focus down and, and put a drop of semen on a slide and, and look at the motility of that semen. Uh, he can also at that point make a, what's called a smear or a stain slide where he can um, actually at very high power look at whether or not those sperm cells have normal um, characteristics or are they abnormal in shape and anatomy. Okay, and that's another thing that we do. Uh, the final thing that he does, it's very, very important, is he determines the concentration of the sperm. And for that, you need a special type of microscope slide. And this is just one example of what's called a hemocytometer. And, and these are made to count the number of different types of cells in a sample of blood in human medicine. But they work really well for counting the number of sperm cells per mill or you know, per volume in a, um, in a collection or in a straw of semen. So in this case, what we have is this thick glass slide. And this slide's much thicker than a microscope slide you'd normally see. And in the middle of the slide, they've milled out kind of a, a channel here and a channel there. And there's like a high spot, I call these shoulders, that, that, that's higher than the channels on either side. And right about here, and also right here, there's a, a grid. So basically, there's a machine that puts very, very fine lines across this area, okay? And then they go in this direction too. And the grid actually looks like this. And, and to give you an example of size, this is one millimeter um, from here to here by one millimeter from here to here. So this, this square that I'm looking at is three millimeters by three millimeters. And you notice it's been etched up and down. Um, the glass has been etched. And in the middle here, we end up with all these really neat squares. And Without getting into too much detail, what you do is you take a sample of the semen from either the collection you got from the buck or from the um, thawed semen straw, and you dilute it a certain amount. Uh, you have to dilute it down to a point where you're not counting a million cells under the microscope. Um, you dilute a known amount, and then you basically put that sample on the slide. And I didn't tell you there's a cover slip that sits above this little area here, about one tenth of a millimeter. So again, this area actually has a, a height, a width, and a depth. And that, because of that, each one of these squares that we're counting has a volume, okay? And if we look at, for example, this little block of squares and bring it up and we put our diluted sample in, that's what this blue is, is they're actually using a dyed sample to show you the, the fluid that was put in by a pipette went down here and filled this little area, uh, we can actually count cells. And again, this, this shows blood cells because they're round. Imagine each of these having a little tail on it, okay? And uh, before these go in, they're put into a solution of, of something that'll stop motility. Uh, there's a number of those types of solutions on the market. So what we do is we wanna kill these sperm cells so they're not swimming around, we can actually count them. So we, we do the uh, initial pipetting we allow those sperm cells to settle down to the bottom of the, the slide where the grid is, and then we count them. And in this case, we're, we're counting, you know, one, two, three, four, this one's not in, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and okay, 18. So that number will be multiplied by a constant, depending on how big this square is, what the volume of this square is, and how much we diluted, the sample, if we dilute the sample 100 times, we've got to multiply that number by 100, uh, basically to get to the number of cells in a millimeter, I mean, in a, in, a, in a milliliter. So in this case, you know, we might end up, this might mean 16 million cells per mil. Um, and that would give us an idea of the, the you know, final concentration in, in that particular straw. So very, very important. Um, and again, 
Another very important thing is, you know, before the sample goes into the animal, we want to make sure uh, to put this on a regular slide with a cover slip, uh, make sure it's, you know, it's at room temperature. A lot of these microscopes are actually heated so that the stage that the slide the, that the sperm cells are on is at body temperature. Um, and we want to make sure that those cells are moving, okay? If you don't feel comfortable with doing these kinds of things, uh, there's many large animal veterinarians or small ruminant veterinarians out there who have backgrounds in animal reproduction. It's called theriogenology. Um, and they may be willing to work with you on your farm during breeding season to do a lot of these things. And they also have their own equipment, so you don't have to buy a lot of these um, different items. You'll notice over here on the right, um, this fellow's got a bunch of little containers that have colored things in them. And those are actually filled with different colored um, semen straws. So he's going to be loading the semen that he's got here um, into a diluent. He has to dilute it. It's very concentrated when it comes out of the ram. He's got to dilute it a certain amount um, so that we have a known dose of sperm cells in each one of those. And in this case, they're using half cc straws. And again, just to show you a little close up in, in, um, in this ram station in Iceland, they actually have different colored straws for each one of the rams that's, that's being used. It's, it's kind of an interesting procedure. Um, this shows you some of the straws. And, and these straws have actually been packed already with, with semen. So, um, and again, we'll, we'll show you the, the process of, of how the straw is put together and things in another video. But in this case, this straw is sealed top and bottom. Um, so it's waterproof. The sperm cells are, are in a solution inside of here. And in this case, it was put into a, a cup that contains water at um, basically just below body temperature. And what they do in this case to bring the semen down to a temperature where it can be frozen is they put it into a cold room. So they actually have a room next door. It's actually on the other side of this wall here um, where the sperm cells over a matter of hours go from basically room temperature down to refrigerator temperature. Um, at that point, those um, straws are put into um, thermoses, just like you would have, you, know, you can buy in the United States thermos brand thermoses that are filled with ice water. So water at refrigerator temperature. Um, we'll put straws in them that need to go to a farm, put the top on, um, and then basically send that down the road. And these systems are very simple, they're very inexpensive, and, and they're used to basically get semen to almost every farm in Iceland. Iceland's about the size of Massachusetts, um, but it's full of mountains and volcanoes and glaciers. So it's hard to get from one place to another in Iceland. But, but anyway, it's, it's a really neat system. They breed about 30,000 ewes a year using this system. Um, in most cases, when you're working with goat AI, you're not gonna be using chilled semen. I wanna mention that because it's a neat system and it is actually applicable to um, some goat breeds and you know, systems and groups of people, groups of farms in the United States. There's a number of ways we can ship semen um, commercially. Uh, this up here is something called an equitainer. Uh, in the equine breeding industry, a lot of stallions are collected. Um, their semen is collected, it's processed in much the same way. Um, and then it's packaged and shipped chilled to other farms. So for example, you might be interested in breeding to a stallion in California and you live in New York state. They would collect the semen. Uh, they would put it in, what, this is actually a, an inexpensive um, semen transport container. And this one's made of hard, you know, plastic, kind of like football helmet plastic that's got lots of insulation in it. Um, both of these are used to ship chilled semen across the country. And, and, and stallions, this will last several days before you have to use it. It's a neat system. And this can also be used for goats and sheep, certainly, if, if you want to ship semen that way. Um, this again shows you the thermos that was used in Iceland. This is um, another, this is basically what this looks like. Um, this is called an equitainer. And it has a container that holds the semen. It has a coolant container. It looks like a tuna fish can. It's got some special liquid in it. And it's got what's called ballast bags. But anyway, it's highly insulated. Uh, FedEx will take it. Um, they've even got coverings on them <coughs> that prevent x-rays at the airport from damaging the DNA in the, the sperm cells. But anyway, neat systems. 
Um, this is actually probably what you're going to be dealing with. This is a liquid nitrogen tank. Uh, liquid nitrogen tank, again, is a thermos much like this one, except it's much larger. It's built to be much more insulative than a, a thermos you could buy at the store. Okay. Uh, we can put liquid nitrogen in a tank of this size, for example, and it would keep semen frozen for weeks to months. Okay, and so you're not looking at days, you're looking at weeks to months in this case. And storage semen tanks, liquid nitrogen tanks you might have at your farm, um, I've got one in my lab that will go for two months uh, without a charge pretty safely if it, hasn't been, if it doesn't get moved very much. So in these cases, You've got this tank, and within the tank, there's, you know, thick walls. It's a double-walled container with a vacuum in between them. But there's all this space inside that's filled with liquid nitrogen. And down the middle, there's these containers called canisters that that fit along the outside of of the inner tank. And they kind of fit in the big circle uh, to use up the space within there efficiently. And then when you want to collect this. Uh, a straw, you actually bring one of these can canisters up to the top. And within them, we, we keep the straws. And we have systems of organizing these things and all that, that allow us to find the straw pretty quickly um, from a particular animal if you've got multiples in your tank. So you need to have one of these at your farm if you're going to plan a breeding season um, to inseminate does using frozen semen by AI. Uh, tanks, you know, new tanks are run $1,000 or more for a good tank. You might get one cheaper used. So again, buyer beware, make sure it works. Um, but this is a substantial investment. So that's a, sort of a, a beginner's guide or a start to um, artificial insemination, showing you some of the things you might need. Uh, certainly I'm gonna talk about aspects of these in other uh, videos and other parts of the presentation uh, as we go along. Thank you.